David Seymour, I am the director of the Saskatchewan office for the Frontier Centre for Public Policy, uh, and I'm very pleased to welcome all of you here today. I'm somebody who I regard as a Canadian hero, and the reason that I say that is that we all appreciate a healthcare professional who is prepared to go that little bit further uh, for their patients. But Dr. Jacques Charlie is a real fighter who took uh, his patient's case through an eight-year court battle, which ultimately culminated uh, in a ruling by the, free, by the Supreme Court that has some considerable implications for Canadian health care. You see, every country, including Canada, uh, has policy based on some underlying and constitutional rules. And what the Supreme Court decision that we now regard as the Shaoli trial did was demonstrate a precedent that two of the really underlying uh, policy rules uh, of Canada uh, can be seen to be in conflict. That is the idea of universal and exclusively public health care provision uh, and the right to security of the person. Now, whether you may be an advocate of Medicare who sees this decision as a threat uh, to that system, whether you may be an advocate of private health care who sees this as an opportunity for that system, or whether you may be a patient uh, who is simply interested in getting better health care, there is no question uh, that the Shaoli ruling has implications, and there is no question that Dr. Shaoli is the man that we are very proud to, to present because he was at the centre uh, of that ruling. Now, I was very excited this morning when I met Dr. Shaoli because not only is he French, but he's French in the sense uh, that he's actually from France, and I felt I might get the opportunity uh, to use both my years of, of high school French language instruction. Uh, he quickly informed me that there is nothing worse than French spoken uh, with a New Zealand accent. Um, actually, he didn't say that, he's far too kind. But uh, Dr. Charles, as I said, uh, went to the university in Paris where he became a medical doctor. Uh, he's since moved uh, to Quebec where he's, he's made his home in, in Canada for most of his life. And uh, as he'll explain, he's been involved uh, in a very famous court case, which is the subject of our discussion today. So uh, it's going to be a great pleasure on behalf of the Frontier Centre to wel welcome Dr. Jacques Charlie. Thank you. Thank you very much for this just click and it'll go through. Thank you very much for this uh, kind of invitation and introduction. Thank you very much for all of you to be, uh, to be here today. And uh, yes, indeed, uh, I'm very happy to, uh, to, to be able to, uh, to speak with you. And I hope to answer to many of your questions about what is uh, going on in, uh, in healthcare in, in our country. And uh, yes, as you see, after the Shaoli judgment, what is next, but let's remind a little bit what was in the, in the judgment itself. And this is an extract of the uh, judgment. Uh, and I quote here, after reviewing a number of public health care systems, the Standing Senate Committee on Social Affairs, Science and Technology concluded in the Kirby report that far from undermining public health care, Private distribution and insurance improve the breadth and quality of healthcare for all citizens. And it ultimately concluded at page 66 of the ruling that the evidence suggests that the contribution of direct, direct payments by patients allowing private insurance to cover some services, even in publicly funded hospitals and an expanded role for the private sector in the delivery of health services are the factors which have enabled countries to achieve broader coverage of health services for all their citizens. Not only for few, for all their citizens. And it is the ruling of the Canadian Supreme Court. And they continue. Some countries like Australia and Singapore openly encourage private sector participation as a means to ensure affordable and sustainable health services. Again, 
all the cities of the country, of those countries. This is a major statement, I suggest, from the highest court of this land. <coughs> Some people say, well, but in Canada, it's not like other countries. We don't have enough uh, professionals. What are the facts? Those are the facts. And the facts are that, for example, in New Zealand, they don't have more doctors than in Canada. No, they do have in, uh, in Japan. So what's wrong then? And put, it, put, it, put that simply, what is wrong is that because they are just fed up and they don't have the financial incentive to work more. But nurses, the same situation. We have in Canada more nurses than the average uh, OECD. In 2005, those number of part-time nurses wanted to rather be working full-time if they could. In 2008, the Montreal Economic Institute of Montreal made a very interesting study showing that, and I quote here, for shifts, shifts on weekdays, the majority of nurses responded that they would be inclined to work from four to eight extra hours or from 9 to 16 extra hours a month in the private sector in addition to their usual duties. Again, in addition to their usual duties. So don't tell me that they are going to destroy Medicare. To the contrary. What I'm suggesting and what I submitted to the Supreme Court is that far from hurting the Medicare system, it would help the Medicare system. That, that being said, that being said, should the government further restrict access to, to health care because of the financial <coughs> constraint? It might happen, <coughs> particularly with the economic slowdown that we are going to face in Canada and worldwide. There is much reason to, to think that that is going to happen. Then a parallel private healthcare system might not succeed in reducing the waiting time in the public system. And then, is it possible to conceive then in Canada that a for-profit parallel private healthcare system to be socially acceptable under such a circumstances? And my answer is yes. Now I'll tell you what and how. Let's have a look to, you, you've heard probably, the Nobel Peace Prize 2006 for economics. No, I'm sorry. He's an economist, he was an economist, but he got a Nobel Peace Prize. And why is that so? why he didn't get economic Nobel Peace Prize is that he, he initiated the microcredit system to bring, to move poor people of Bangladesh out of poverty. And the Nobel Committee calculated that that was the best way to improve peace in the world. And I fully, fully agree with that analysis, of course. <coughs> but this Professor Muhammad Yunus from Bangladesh, Professor Economy, he went further and he decided to address the issue of uh, healthcare in his own country, Bangladesh, enjoying a med universal Medicare system also on the paper. But of course, the government also in that country, even of course more than in, even in Canada, they have financial problems. So, this Nobel Peace Prize, he announced the opening of four profit private hospitals in Bangladesh, whereby patients would be charged based on their ability to pay, with wealthier clients charged at the market price, 
and the poor at subsidized or even at no fee at all. At the ceremony of opening of that first private hospital, of course, the Minister of Health of Bangladesh was attending and applauding this initiative. In those hospitals already opened, because after he made an another one, everyone received the same high quality of treatment. While all patients will be expected to pay something, no one will be denied care. This concept he developed is called social business enterprise. And I believe that we could apply that in Canada <coughs> alongside alongside the private healthcare system, the traditional capitalistic system that we are used to. And the reason why I am bringing to you this concept is for the following reason. Canada is unique in the world in the sense that we have a hard time to sell, if I can say, to sell the idea of a for profit in healthcare. No other country has the same problem, but we have this problem in Canada, despite the judgment of the, the Supreme Court. We have to address that issue. We have to show that for profit in healthcare can be good not only for the capitalist, the rich people, the, the capitalist people, it can, do, it can do also good to the poor people. And I suggest that people in the civil society, any people, you guys, you make together, let's say, a half million dollar amount of money you put on the table, to establish a private clinic, for profit private clinic somewhere in Canada. Your half million dollar will be get back, you get back to you. It's not a charity, it will be a loan. But you will renounce to be a shareholder, you will renounce to have interest, and the shareholder will be poor people. Poor people will be shareholders. Poor people will have to manage, with the help of course, with expertise, they will have to manage that business a for-profit business, they will have to make money out of it to be self-sustainable. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you will be very proud as a Canadian to speak to the journalists who are going to be very, very thirsty to interview you. That what, what did you do? What is that? And you will tell them, look, this is a way that, this is a proof that for-profit in, in healthcare can do good to the poor people, alongside the traditional private for profit healthcare. In my view, after those years of thinking, for this country, this is the, the medicine of this country, for this country. If you want to, to really move this country in the right direction. Because if you if we just go on the classic route of making private initiative, the classic for-profit private route, which is good, I have nothing against that, but if it's only that, in Canada, we are going to face a lot of problems and obstacles on the issue of moral, morality. So there are a lot of uh, issues relating to this concept of social business enterprise don't need to go through all those details. But even this Professor Yunus mentioned in, his, in a very interesting book he published recently, and I really recommend you to read, especially today, is Toward the New Capitalist, is the title of this book. In French, there are, there are nouveaux capitalists. Where, in which he mentioned that to reconcile the concept of capitalism <coughs> with the need of a, the needs of a uh, civil society, we have to we have to adopt additional ways of making business. 
such a social business enterprise. And he went further mentioning that this Modgo's model could apply even in, the, in particular in the United States. Very interesting, mentioning that if in the United States we have so many people uninsured, one way to, to address that issue in the United States for the uninsured it would be to social business enterprise dealing with the with with private insurances on that concept of as, as the social business enterprise. I found that very interesting. I will stop this uh, the slides now, it's, it's, it's enough. I would like to, uh, to go more on the uh, informal uh, question period. One point I'll just to mention before the, my clo closing statement here. And I want to come back to the issue of morality, particularly here in Canada. Is it moral or immoral for a patient to get a fast access to a medical required service because he has money in his pocket. And since the other one who does not have the money will continue to wait and suffer on the waiting list. Is this moral or is this immoral? I suggest that <coughs> not only it is moral, but I suggest to you that it is a moral obligation to, to help that person who has money in his pocket to use his money and to get a fast access to healthcare as long as he doesn't bother another person. And the reason why I tell you that, it is because, excuse me, I will use the uh, Christian moral. I am not a religious person, I am agnostic, but I have studied the religions, and I, I feel that in the religion there are a lot of things very interesting to, to grab. And the concept of morality in the religion struck me. Because what they say in, in, the, in all the religions, actually, not only the Christian, they say you should feel sorry when you see somebody suffering, first of all. And second, you should feel happy if another person gets happy. And also, the Ten Commandments, you, would, you should not have envy, you should not be, have a jealousy, you should not think to save the belonging of another person, and so on. Those are the moral values I feel comfortable with. And when you have, you have been told that in the in name of social justice, everybody should be equal, and if I cannot get it, you should not get it. And if I suffer, you have to suffer also. I am sorry. But this is against moral values. So that was my comments, and uh, I'm ready for it. Wow. I've been doing some research on Sigurd tonight. Um, well, I'll take a really quick question. Well, thank you, folks, and uh, thank you particularly to, to Jacques. Uh, I'll, I'll now uh, take some questions to, to direct to, to Jacques. Um, Tom, is it to Yeah, uh, I have a friend from Switzerland, and he says uh, basically there's a free, a free church system in Switzerland, which the Social Democrats in Switzerland support. And uh, uh, basically, if you have money and you want special attention, special care and attention, you, uh, you pay first of all for the bottom tier insurance. And then, uh, if you want special care and attention and you have money, you get the chief of surgery's immediate attention, you pay 100% of his fee, and you pay 100% tax on that fee that goes back into the health system. Social Democrats argue as long as you pay the tax, you're entitled to special care and attention. And that means you don't have to wait in line. But those people have resources, acquire more financial resources. How does that sound as logic to you? 
Well, thank you very much for, for this very interesting uh, question and comment. Yes, the, the, the system of Switzerland is very interesting. It's basically a system where everybody has the obligation to buy a private insurance. And those who are not able, uh, the federal government of Switzerland step in and pay the premium of the private insurance. That being said, those who want additional service or more services, yes, they can pay and they get additional services. Also, if a group of population inside that country of Switzerland, if they want to get a higher level of services, they may do so. Just at the end of the day, their premium will increase. And that is fine, because the customers are the one to decide which level of services they want to get, and of course to pay for. And I don't see anything wrong with that. Uh, Jacques, could I, could I ask a question? I, we often have healthcare debates in Canada where we compare ourselves uh, to the American system. And uh, I, I think we know there are problems with the American system. I, I think looking at uh, what's going on down there in their election, most of the Americans uh, know too. Uh, I'd like to ask, can you give us a quick outline of the difference between um, the medical system we have in Canada uh, versus in France? Yeah. It's a very interesting question, actually. In France, as you know, there is universal healthcare system. Everybody gets access to healthcare services in France. Everybody. But in France, the World Health Organization ranked France as the number one in the world, the best healthcare system in the world. And you know what? You have more for profit private hospitals in France than you have in the United States in proportion. It's a fact. More for profit private hospitals in France than in the United States. How come? Well, it is because, and it comes back to what I said earlier, it means it's not because it's a for profit that it's against the morale. <coughs> as simple as that. And also, you have in France people who can get the service, the private service they want by paying out of money with their own money or with a, a additional insurance, private insurance. And you have doctors who are practicing mixed public in the public and in the private system. You have all, all those things that in Canada are taboo, they are perfectly applied since a very long time in France with the blessing of the World Health Organization ranking France as the best healthcare system in the world is a universal action. Uh, other questions? Sylvain. Sorry. Yeah. Dr. Uh, Chalouet, I, my name is Sylvain Lavoie from the University of Regina. I'm from Montreal, so originally. I want to commend you for your courage. Uh, you must have taken a lot of courage and, of course, money to go through the process that you've been through. Uh, my question to you is, uh, while you were going through that process, uh, were you exposed to a tremendous amount of pressure from colleagues, uh, doctors, physicians, nurses, people that are part of the healthcare system right now, and uh, do, would you believe that that would be symptomatic of the actual problem? Yes, it was. It was symptomatic at that time. Yes, true. Uh, I tell you uh, a fact. It was, uh, we were in 1999. I was preparing the trial, the first, first instance in Montreal. I was establishing my evidence, preparing my evidence, the testimonies and, and everything. Big job. And among those witnesses I wanted to get, I targeted the president of the Quebec Association of Oncology. I never spoke to him before, never ever. I just wanted him to get into the box and speak to the judge. 
my colleagues were so hostile at that time, generally speaking. What I did, I went to the court because I was doing everything by myself without a lawyer. I went to the court at the dress and I said, I need to send a subpoena to that individual. How we do? <laughs> they say, you have to pay a stamp and uh, fill up this form of subpoena and we will send the subpoena. The court will send the subpoena. We will give you the paper and you will have to go to a private office of a bailiff and they will provide the, the subpoena to the, that individual. <laughs> the answer is it was not always easy. <laughs> and he was located, he was located two hours away from Montreal by driving in the city of Sherwood City. The guy was mad. When he came at the day of the hearing, I remember, he came in the hallway of the court, you know. <laughs> And he came to me, he was shouting at me, you know, moments before entering into the box, you know. So I was wondering what I'm going to do with this guy, you know. I put him in the box or not. And I was scared, you know, he's going to kill me in the box. <laughs> you cannot control. It. And if one thing, you know, all lawyers tell, tell you you should never do, you know, is to put into the box a witness that you cannot, you don't control. So I did. <laughs> I think I did, uh, as a lawyer, it was very against the... Uh, what you want. Yeah, because he came into the... I decided to put him into the box. And actually, he told all the truth to the judge. All the truth and nothing but the truth. And it was very good for my, my, my case. So it is an anecdote I wanted to tell you. Uh, we had a question here, sir. I'm just interested in your assessment of how the Quebec government has responded to the judgment in your case. And my understanding is that they've dealt with it through allowing private funding and insurance for certain procedures and mostly on a publicly funded rather than a patient funded basis. So I'm interested in your general, your general assessment of, of how Quebec responded and how that's working, but also the approach to go with the, with the a combination of selected procedures and through the public payer system. You know, uh, the Quebec government, any, any Quebec government would be, from any political party, they would have a hard time dealing with that issue, like any provincial government in Canada. <coughs> so the, the, the Quebec government took a step-by-step -step approach. And they did made they did make some openings, uh, which I consider that it is a step in the right direction. There would be uh, additional steps to be taken. Uh, I'm convinced that those steps are going to come in the future. I am I am actually collaborating. I am in a, in a mood of collaborating with the uh, government both provincial and, and federal. When I say collaborating, I want to say that I have a, a good understanding of, of the, uh, the problems they are facing, and they have a good understanding of what I want to achieve. We don't have any formal relationship or whatsoever, but we have a good understanding of each other, a, a mature way, and uh, as far as Quebec is concerned, I'm very optimistic to move forward uh, a good evolution in our healthcare system in Quebec. And I would say that I am confident also that I could uh, make some uh, contribution to uh, uh, make that happen elsewhere uh, in the country as well. Yes, sir. Uh, it's my understanding that Quebec has moved further to Call it private health care facilities and private health care delivery than any other provinces. That, am I right in thinking that? You are right. You are right. You are right, and that is one of the results of my job. In the sense that the Quebec government has uh, paid the way for more uh, uh, private health care facilities surgery centers, private surgery centers, uh, 
uh, following my judgment. There is a jury sentence passing to the that's a follow-up. How, do, how, does that, how does that work? Are the day surgeries referred from the public system, or are people paying there are two separately? Ways. Yeah, there are two ways. One way is that uh, such a facility is subcontracted to the government, by the public authority, and you have also a part of private financing. You have a, a, a way where you have uh, private, privately financed, or at least partially privately financed surgeries performed in private facilities in Quebec. Yeah. So definitely, Quebec is much in advance uh, compared to other provinces as far as private health care is concerned. One last question on that, and how how does that work with the Canada Health Act? Yeah. Regarding the Canada Health Act, that is an issue which I have been uh, arguing before the courts. And I got in the judgment, you might have the interest to, to get the, to, the, to the judgment of the Supreme Court, they agreed with my argument when I said that the Canada Health Act does not uh, prohibit private health care in Canada. Thank you. Does not. very clear. And again, that is a very important misconception in this country, that the Canada Health Act prohibits private health care. Well, wrong. That's it. I have to ask you to talk some more about that, if you would, please, because I always understood that the Canada Health Act requires public administration. Public. No? Well, what the Canada make it simple. What the Canada Health Act wants, the Canada Health Act wants a public universal health care system in each province. Period. And they want that. And they want that. When a doctor from Medicare is billing a patient to Medicare. I repeat, when a doctor from Medicare <coughs> decides, decides to treat a patient within Medicare and to, to get paid by Medicare, then the Canada Health Act wants that doctor to stick to the public fee and not charge an additional amount of money to that patient. But the Canada Health Act does not oblige that doctor to participate in Medicare. Very important distinction here. The Canada Health Act says that when a doctor decides to work in Medicare, the Canada Health Act does not say that all the doctors must work in Medicare. There is no such a provision in the Canada Health Act because Canada has not been established on the principle of the uh, Marxist regime. So there is this basic freedom in this country. So that is the reason why what I'm telling you is that the Canada Health Act is much open actually to private health care in the way that it works in European countries or other countries of OECD. And that is the reason why, in my understanding, the current federal government does not make big noise of what the initiatives about private health care in the country. Because they have, in my understanding, that view, that analysis of the Canada Health Act. And I would agree with the, the, the federal government if this is their take on the, on the Canada Health Act. So I, I hope that I brought to you some refreshing <laughs> perspective today. <laughs> Yes. Uh, maybe then, uh, given that there's such a common misconception about what the Canada Health Act uh, contains, maybe if you could explain a little more clearly what the judgments in your case did and did not say. Ah, but you know, 
what people say, there are, there are several ways to say things. things. <laughs> and you can say something explicitly, and you can say something implicitly. It depends on the capacity of the, the other person to analyze, to, uh, to read, or to understand. The reason why I tell you that, it is because, again, again, this Supreme Court of Canada had very hard time with my belief, with no doubt. They had very hard time. It was okay. a very hard issue. Yeah. I'm and the way that they, they, uh, they came out is to uh, technically uh, lift the ban on the uh, uh, private health insurance. Mentioning that people they should be free to use their own financial resources to save their skin. So that at least was explicit. Okay. okay. But what I would suggest to you is that there would be other conclusion to draw from this judgment. That and I would speak as a lawyer, if I would be a lawyer, to tell you that. A lawyer could go to a court, invoke the judgment, and say to the, to the, to the judge, in, in light of the Shaolin judgment, any coercive action taken by any government in this country, having in healthcare, having the effect of making people, an, indi an individual, only one individual, suffer or die because of that coercive action, and where that coercive action, you cannot demonstrate that it is needed to achieve a public health care system, any, I say, any coercive action would be deemed unconstitutional. Ah. This is what I would teach to, to law students in Canada as a result of my judgment. Because those are the arguments I have made, I have pleaded by myself without a lawyer, against the advice of the <laughs> elite lawyers of this country. And I went through and I got the, this judgment from the Canadian Supreme Court. In other words, I, I brought a new interpretation of the Canadian Constitution to the Canadian Supreme Court. And that is what I wanted to convey. Mm -hmm. Okay, we uh, have time for one further question. Right. Yes. <coughs> How do you see private health care uh, operating in smaller population areas? Because much of what we see in Canada is in the larger cities, a million, million population and older. So I'm just interested in, in Quebec and smaller, smaller cities and towns, or a place like Saskatchewan. How does the smaller market and smaller population base uh, impact on private health In my view, I believe in the concept of individual and I would apply that to the responsibility of a community, any community, to be anywhere in this planet. If a community, they want something, as a government, I would let them organize the way they want to get what they need. And it means, particularly, to have private to develop, to establish private health care, privately financed by the community, by whoever, then you have a problem. As a government, I will give you the opportunity to bring your own solution. And if at some point the government can help, government should be there to help, not to bother, basically. Okay, well. Please join me in thanking Dr. Shalit for a very thought-provoking presentation.